So welcome and good afternoon, everyone. I am the moderator for this one hour webinar today. So you're all very welcome. My name is Catherine Nocton and I'm from the European Disability Forum. And you should be able to, those of you who need to access sign language interpretation, you should be able to see our sign language interpreter, Gerdinand. You should also be able to activate the captions through Zoom. But if you have any technical difficulties at all, just use the chat box to communicate with our colleagues who will help you immediately. So you're all very welcome. This webinar will also be recorded by Tor and uploaded in YouTube. So now I'm going to go directly to the content of the webinar today. So as we all know, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has been extremely widely ratified globally with over 190 CRPD ratifications around the world. But implementation is proving difficult. And today we're going to see that in Nordic countries, uh, this is their no exception. And in particular today, we're going to deal with the issue of incorporation of the convention um, into national law. And I'm particularly interested in this topic when um, our Norwegian members reached out to us and asked us how many countries have done this and how well is it going? Uh, I had to say from the European Disability Forum that we didn't have information on this. And when we looked, we could see that it hasn't really been happening in other countries. It hasn't been happening on a wide scale. So today we're going to look at the experience of Norway, and we're also going to hear from legal experts, also from the committee, and then from some of the, the, the disabled persons organizations, the organizations of persons with disabilities in the Nordic countries. So. We're starting with Norway because Norway is where we're going to, they're, they're the most advanced on this and where we're going to learn from. And so they've initiated the process and we're gonna hear about how that is going. So we're gonna start with the importance and the implications of incorporation of the Convention into International Law. We're gonna hear from Ivan de Granes, who's advisor from the Norwegian Human Rights Institute. Would you like to turn on your camera so we have you? You're very welcome, Ivan, you have the floor. You want to share your presentation yourself as well. Yes, thank you. Perfect, we hear you. And we can see your presentation. All right, so um, my name is uh, Ivan de Gremes and I work uh, as an advisor at the Norwegian Human Rights Institution. Very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to speak about um, incorporation of CRPD, uh, what it is and why it is important. I will not go that uh, far into um, the situation and the process that uh, we are currently in in Norway, um, but uh, I'm sure that Kjetil will add uh, insight uh, in that process uh, when he talks after me. Um, so briefly about uh, Norwegian NHRI, we are uh, a public body that uh, gives advice on the implementation of human rights in Norway. Um, and we are uh, uh, a little bit over uh, 20 employees working uh, here in Norway on this. Uh, and um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, in, in order to understand uh, incorporation of the CRPD, um, it is necessary to place this in a context of how human rights treaties are implemented more broadly in national law. Um, and um, in order to talk a little bit about this, then we need to understand that different countries have different legal systems. So that is why also that look, this looks a little bit different in different countries. Um, broadly speaking, um, there are two main uh, forms uh, or legal systems in terms of how countries 
uh, implement um, uh, international treaties. Uh, one is dualistic countries, uh, which have separate legal systems between international and national law. And here uh, it is required for a, with a legal act to make sure that um, uh, conventions internationally are made into national law. And, uh, and then you have uh, monistic legal systems where, which, uh, where international and national law uh, is uh, united legal systems and where international conventions are directly applicable in national or as national law. Um, and in the Nordic countries, all have a dualistic system. Um, and so um, there are different ways to implement uh, international conventions in national law. Uh, one is uh, passive transforma tr transformation, uh, where a country uh, says that there is legal harmony between the convention uh, in question and national legislation. Um, and then you have a more active form of transformation where national legislation is changed in order to uh, better live up to the duties under the convention. Uh, and then the a third form is incorporation, which we're talking about here, uh, where uh, an international convention is um, is uh, placed under uh, or taken in actively into national law. This can be done in various forms. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, you could have uh, or different countries have different systems. In some countries, uh, you have um, uh, incorporation uh, as at the level of regular national legislation. Uh, and other countries, you have uh, incorporation with what we call precedence, which means that when there is conflict between the relevant convention and national legislation, the, um, the convention uh, wins that conflict. Uh, if it's not explicit in the, the in the law, the incorporation law, then it uh, varies uh, depending on the circumstances. Sometimes it can uh, take precedence; other times it's it cannot. Um, so this is broadly speaking where uh, the the generally the forms of implementation you can have, and different countries have different ways of approaching this. But we also have to remember um, two things, and that is that uh, irrespective of whether or not a country has incorporated a convention in their national legislation, uh, they are uh, already, they've already, um, uh, the, the convention is already legally binding upon ratification. So this is the case for a CRPD. Uh, which has been ratified by all Nordic countries, and therefore it is already legally binding. So we have to not understate this point. The other thing is that uh, in many countries, uh, there is a, a principle of presumption of conformity with international law, meaning that uh, this is a rule where domestic law is uh, as far as possible read to be consistent with international law. And uh, this, in many cases, avoids a direct conflict. So we are talking about incorporation. Often we talk about the, va the value of incorporation can often be that um, uh, human rights conventions take precedence over national law. But in many cases, this conflict doesn't uh, uh, it often gets solved through this. Um, and so this is, I just uh, had a look at the report uh, for this uh, webinar and um, uh, also based on uh, what we already know about the implementation of CRPD in Nordic, Nordic countries. 
you have different systems for this in different countries. In Denmark, uh, has chosen passive transformation. Uh, and when it comes to other conventions, only the European Convention of Human Rights is incorporated. In Sweden, uh, as far as I understand, there's a combination between passive and active transformation. Um, in Finland, uh, this is the only country in, in Nordic countries which has, has incorporated CRPD as national law, and it has also made, made a number of legal changes to better implement the convention. Uh, in Iceland, uh, there's been active transformation and, uh, and there is a process for incorporation planned. And in Norway uh, has uh, a passive transformation and uh, as we, we were as the uh, we've already been told there's a process ongoing for incorporation of uh, the CRPD uh, at the time of this event so this just is to show that uh, it's kind of fragmented in the Nordic countries how uh, both the CRPD and human rights treaties in general are incorporated into national law or whether they are incorporated into national law. And so what are the main implications of incorporation? So one of the main uh, kind of consequences of an incorporation can be to strengthen the CRPD's legal position in the country. Um, uh, this, of course, depends a little bit on whether or not uh, uh, how the incorporation law looks like. But uh, if uh, the CRPD is incorporated, it's directly applicable as law and uh, can also take precedence over other legislation, depending on how the incorporation law looks like. Um, so this is, of course, important, but uh, I think I want to stress the second point here even more, because this is kind of, an, as I, far as I see it, an understated point, which is maybe the most important. And that is that an incorporation can send a signal of the importance of rights of persons with disabilities and the importance of the convention. Um, so the CRPD, one of the main points of the CRPD is to ensure non-discrimination and equality for people with disabilities. And uh, I think that uh, at least from the Nor uh, experience of Norway, um, the uh, when it comes to other conventions, it has uh, incorporation of other conventions has helped to raise knowledge about the convention nationally. Uh, and it has improved the uh, processes uh, in terms of making new legislation so that uh, it uh, um, better complies with the convention. So, so this is more of a, a broad kind of consequence of the uh, incorporation process, which is very important and I think maybe um, has to be stressed as well. So um, I'm not going to say uh, that much more about, um, about this, uh, other than that, of course, uh, we at the Norwegian Human Rights Institution, we are um, positive to incorporating the CRPD into national law, and we want it to be in placed in the Human Rights Act in Norway so that it takes precedence over uh, other national legislation. But I think we also need to um, realize that incorporation is not a quick fix in terms of uh, implementing CRPD at the national level. Um, as I said, the countries are already fully legally binded by CRPD upon ratification. Um, and um, there are also, th that's the experience from other conventions that are incorporated into national law, there still exists human rights challenges. So I don't think we can uh, say that it will fix all problems, but it will be a meaningful and important step to take. 
Uh, and uh, I think that we can be uh, hopeful about the process that is ongoing in Norway. And uh, and I personally hope that uh, other Nordic countries um, get maybe inspiration from Norway and start a similar process so that more countries in the Nordic countries can, uh, can incorporate uh, the CRPD in their national legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope also not only that Nordic countries take inspiration from this, that many other countries do. So I really appreciate the initiative to make this webinar today very international and very European by including me. So I'm aware of what's going on and we're aware um, of the, the advantages of doing this. And thank you very much, Ivan, for the really clear explanation. Now we're going to go deeper into what's been happening in Norway. So we're going to hear from Professor Chetil Larsen, who's from the University of Oslo. And he's going to explain to us more what has been happening in Norway. So you're very welcome, uh, Chetil, you have the floor. Uh, and we can see your presentation. Excellent, then we're set. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Chetil Mojin Larsen. I'm professor of law at the University of Oslo. And I'm here in the capacity of having been a member of the so-called expert committee in Norway for the incorporation of the CRPD into Norwegian law. I don't really like the term expert committee because we are no more experts than uh, others, but that's the term they chose to use. Just to be sure that everybody is on the same page with regard to the process and why this has now become a report. Uh, the current government in uh, Norway, uh, the government Støre, included in its political platform when it uh, took office that the CRPD should be incorporated into Norwegian law. They didn't specify which law and they didn't, didn't spell out the details. And they simply said it should be incorporated. And it is the assessment of that incorporation in what law, how to do this, what does it mean, etc that they asked this expert committee to do. So we uh, did our work in 2023, submitted our report on 15th of January this year, and it is currently out for a public hearing in Norway with a hearing deadline of 5th of June. It is 500 pages long. I have uh, 11 minutes to summarize it, so it will be short on some points. I will focus on the three main questions that the committee was asked to consider. Uh, the first of those questions is whether the CRPD should be incorporated into the Human Rights Act or into another act, which would in principle be the, equal, the Equality and Anti-Discrimination Act. I'll come back to the difference. The second main question is, what are the legal implications of incorporation uh, in Norwegian law more generally? And the third main question is, what legislative amendments would be required in other legislation in order to incorporate the CRPD? So I'll focus on those three questions uh, in the time to come. <clears throat> First main question is uh, one of the most uh, difficult that the uh, committee discussed, but uh, the easiest question to summarize here. Uh, there is a um, uh, dissenting opinion in the uh, report with regard to which act the, the CRPD should be incorporated in. Uh, the majority of two members, uh, myself and the committee chair, uh, Supreme Court Judge uh, Hilde Inderberg, we recommend incorporation in the Human Rights Act. The minor minority, uh, the third member, uh, former Attorney General um, Sven Ole Fagnes, considers primarily that the CRPD should not be incorporated into Norwegian law at all. Uh, but if it is, as our mandate uh, required us to accept, it should be incorporated into the Equality and in Anti-Discrimination Act, is his um, view. And you could say it's a shame that we uh, failed to reach a consensus on this issue, uh, but we choose to look 
speak more uh, favorably on it, saying that the dissents here um, mean that all views will be visible and transparent in the further process. And it paves the way for the uh, best possible and most constructive uh, process in the government uh, in the follow-up of this uh, report. So, but the committee, the majority of the committee recommends incorporation into the Human Rights Act. The second main question is far more complex and um, challenging perhaps to summarize, and that is what would be the legal implications of incorporation? And that question needs to be divided into two uh, parts. First, what does it mean in Norwegian law that the convention is incorporated at all? Secondly, what uh, would it mean that it is incorporated into the Human Rights Act uh, as compared to being incorporated into another act, typically the Equality and Anti-Discrimination Act? And briefly about the latter question first. Incorporation into the Human Rights Act would mean that a convention would prevail over other legislation in case of conflict. That is the main uh, idea behind the Human Rights Act. Currently, we have five conventions in the Human Rights Act in Norway. Uh, it's the European Convention, it's the two uh, UN Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We have the Children's Rights Convention and we have the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So those five conventions currently prevail over other legislation in case of conflict. And the CRPD would then be the sixth if uh, our recommendation is follow followed up. But our view is that um, the legal implications, sensu stricto, in a strict sense of incorporation into the Human Rights Act compared to incorporation into another act, is not as significant as one would perhaps expect. And that is simply because um, the prevailing effect is uh, important only when there is a conflict of norms. When there is a conflict uh, between a convention and another uh, Norwegian um, act, uh, other Norwegian legislation. And such conflicts, uh, pure conflicts, are quite rare. The much more common approach is that Norwegian law is interpreted in line with international conventions. And you don't really need the prevailing effect to achieve that particular aim. So the main significance is perhaps something else, as Eivind has already alluded to. The main effects of incorporation into the Human Rights Act concerns visibility. It concerns the status of the convention in Norwegian law. It concerns recognition offered by the Norwegian government to those affected by this convention. Incorporation into the Human Rights Act would make the convention more visible for anybody applying the convention, be that courts or local or national authorities, uh, private actors um, and uh, civil society, uh, and so on. It would uh, give the signal that the convention is important in Norwegian law, and so important that we uh, give it the highest status we can within Norwegian law. And those are the main uh, um, points and the main, the main significance of incorporation into the Human Rights Act. Turning slightly to the other question, uh, what, what does it mean to incorporate the convention at all? Um, you could also say that in a very strict, narrow uh, legal sense, the implications may be limited. Again, we have the effect of visibility and recognition, etc. But we already have legal principles in Norway that uh, suggest that the convention should already be applied in full in Norwegian law. We have a uh, provision in the Norwegian constitution, uh, section 92, that calls on all uh, local and national authorities to respect and comply with international law that is binding on Norway, including the CRPD. 
This still applies, and that's um, without incorporation. We have the principle of presumption, as I've been discussed, suggesting that Norwegian law should already now be in interpreted in line with the convention. Um, and we find that remaining controversies and difficulties within uh, the application of the convention in Norwegian law tends to concern interpretation rather than status. It's a question of what the convention says. Can you uh, revoke someone's legal capacity, for instance? That's a question of interpretation, not a question of the status of the convention in Norwegian law. And those questions of interpretation will remain. I need to spend uh, 30 seconds on the interpretive, interpretive declarations that Norway has um, submitted. When we ratified the convention back in 2013, we uh, submitted two such declarations, one on Article 12 and one on Articles 14 and 25. The one on Article 12 says that uh, in Norway's view, Article 12 allows for a revocation of legal capacity as a last resort. And um, the second says that uh, we understand Article 14 to allow for uh, forced uh, involuntary treatment um, of um, uh, persons with disabilities. Um, our mandate was not to consider whether these two declarations should be um, withdrawn. Uh, it was a premise that these should remain. Um, and we don't make a final assessment of whether they are uh, correct. Our uh, conclusion is that they are justifiable, um, leaving it for further discussions and further legal developments um, to consider whether they can be uh, upheld over time. We don't make a final assessment of that. The third main question that the committee was asked to discuss was uh, what is the need for legislative amendments uh, elsewhere? Uh, interestingly, in a sense, we suggest only two minor legislative amendments, and it's a 500 page report suggesting two minor things. What we suggest is an amendment in the Norwegian Passport Act. Uh, which currently says that if you have a serious um, uh, mental disability, uh, which would render, sorry for the bad translation here, but which would render you unable to take care of yourself abroad, you can be denied a passport. And we find that that particular provision is uh, fundamentally uh, not compatible with the CRPD. Apart from that, we find that there are few instances of direct conflict between the CRPD and uh, Norwegian law, and that, is, that it is possible to comply in full with uh, the CRPD within existing Norwegian legislation. To that effect, we refer instead largely to ongoing legislative processes on guardianship, on forced treatment, on abortion, on sexual self-determination, um, on um, assisted uh, living, etc. Um, and simply uh, spelling out what we think the CRPD uh, requires in these areas and calling on the government and further um, analysis to apply those uh, rights in the CRPD in the further process. The Norwegian Equality and Anti-Discrimination Ombud uh, submitted uh, a report on the same issues uh, in December 2023 uh, to supplement uh, the Expert Committee's report. They had a much wider approach than we did. The committee simply looked at um, legislation where amendments was strictly required to incorporate the convention. The Ombud had a wider approach looking at um, situations where it would be um, constructive for better implementation of the convention to amend current legislation. And they suggest a large, much larger number than we did. 
did um, about uh, what about amendments in Norwegian law. One particular question um, that may be interesting for some uh, concerns the issue of local autonomy, which is a contested issue in Norwegian uh, law, or not a contested, but a, a crucial uh, issue where our findings may be controversial. Uh, our view, the committee's view, is that um, uh, incorporation of the CRPD would not affect uh, current Norwegian local autonomy to a particular degree, mainly because we find that local autonomy is already restricted by the CRPD. That local authorities already uh, are under an obligation to respect the CRPD in their um, current work. And as such, the, CR, the incorporation of the CRPD would not um, have a strict legal effect. Expectations? Well, we hope, certainly, that uh, this will lead to a, a bill before the parliament, uh, before the elections in 2025, and we would be surprised if the government is unable to do this. Uh, but there have been no promises about this from the government, and we'll, uh, I don't know anything more about that than anybody else. But what we hope is that our report and the whole process concerning that report already now may uh, contribute to increased visibility and increased awareness of the Convention in Norwegian law, and that already now actors will use uh, the convention to a larger extent. More actors will be aware of the convention, uh, there will be more discussion about what the convention entails, and more actors will simply contribute to developing the awareness of the convention in Norwegian law. There are many remaining challenges. I even said that incorporation is not a quick fix. I uh, fully agree with that. And the difficult questions concerning interpretation of the convention will remain uh, regardless of what conclusion the government ends on uh, with regard to incorporation. We do, ho however, hope that we contribute ever so slightly to the ongoing paradigm shift that um, our assessments and the process concerning this uh, incorporation it contributes to a more human rights model uh, or human rights oriented model of disability in Norwegian law where there is certainly still room for improvement and where the committee has criticized us for slow progress. So I'll leave it at that uh, four minutes over time. My sincere apologies. Thank you so much. This was really um, interesting for us to see the progress that's been made and the opportunities. And I hope like you that the process will be complete uh, by your government uh, in the near future. And you already indicated that it's, you've heard already from the CRPD committee, uh, their view on the progress in Norway, but I'm really happy that I can now introduce um, Marcus Sheffer from the CRPD committee. He's a member of the CRPD committee and not only with experience of reviewing in the past and future Nordic countries, but also the European Union and many countries around the world. So, Marcus, we're really interested in your view from the committee on this topic. You have the floor. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, at the outset, I would like uh, to give a quick reply uh, to, to some statements by Kieto that were made right before. I was quite surprised to hear that the committee assessed the situation in Norway to only to not have, as I, I quote, not too many situations of direct conflict. Uh, when you look at the uh, con concluding observations uh, our committee issued in 2019, uh, you find quite a few very substantial uh, conflicts. Um, uh, on uh, one of the very difficult provisions, Article 24 on uh, education, Article 29 on work and employment, uh, I think Norway is, at least in 2019, at that time was very far from uh, the goals uh, and the aims that uh, the convention requires states' parties to achieve. And a brief aside um, on the Article 12 interpretive declaration, 
we had a very diff diff uh, interesting discussion in the committee with the state with Norwegian uh, with Norway's state party delegation on this. The state party delegation, led by the uh, uh, with the voices of the Ministry of Justice, maintained it was an interpretive declaration. Um, the Supreme Court's uh, jurisprudence, on the other hand, tends. Uh, to uh, to qualifying it as a reservation. And if it is a reservation, an Article 12 reservation runs a good chance of being against the object and purpose of the convention uh, because of the central uh, position that uh, Article 12 has uh, in the convention. So there are plenty of very interesting and far-reaching questions. I want to go through uh, in the next eight minutes or so uh, through a couple of difficulties in uh, incorporation and implementation uh, phase of the convention phases. It is substantially more complex than the European Convention on Human Rights that we've all been uh, used to now. Um, uh, it, uh, it, main, it, it, it contains traditional uh, rights against government interference. It contains uh, many social rights uh, that uh, need to be uh, implemented uh, over time. Um, there are procedural rights in Article 13, access to justice. There are, uh, there's the very specific provision of uh, equal recognition before the law that poses many deep-seated problems to all the countries we've reviewed this far. Uh, there are the specific there are political rights that have a very close relationship to Article 12 in many uh, uh, situations. We have organizational provisions, uh, monitoring provisions. We are the, one of the few uh, international uh, human rights treaties that have uh, mandatory uh, independent monitoring. And then we also have uh, the procedural provisions with respect to participation of persons with disabilities and their organizations. So it's a whole, it's a plethora of differently structured guarantees that each of them needs different, needs to be incorporated differently in order to become effective. When we start with the traditional rights against government interference, what you usually do is you, uh, for example, prohibition of arbitrary killing under Article 10 or the prohibition of torture under Article 15. Uh, these are probably the easiest one to, uh, to, to, to incorporate. Um, you could uh, simply uh, make the, the convention directly applicable in this respect, and you would be, uh, we would have achieved quite, uh, quite something. It's much more difficult when you get to social rights, because social rights to some degree are justiciable. Uh, our committee in Handley v. Australia, in a case uh, we, uh, we handed down a, a year ago about, um, we dealt with one of the, uh, the social rights uh, basically the, the right to get audio description on TV. Uh, it's a very small area, but still, um, it can be justiciable. Uh, in that area, it's quite simple to, uh, it's, it's not that difficult to incorporate, but how do you incorporate social rights uh, that uh, are subject to a consecutive uh, implementation over time? Uh, that requires careful, drafting of national legislation, you can't just tinker a bit with your uh, existing social rights legislation. Uh, we've seen that with Sweden uh, in, the, in the last session uh, where it just didn't work. Uh, the, and that relates to the underlying logic of the convention and the idea of who is a person with disabilities and what does it mean not to discriminate against her. Um, the, Prohibition of discrimination is different, structurally different than the prohibition of discrimination, for example, in the European Convention uh, in the other and in the other U UN uh, human rights uh, treaties, because it you you cannot just simply have a, uh, a have have a, a reasoned argument to justify uh, an unequal treatment. 
that is not available under the convention. And that makes it very difficult uh, for countries to incorporate because it usually uh, challenges deep-rooted uh, legal principles under domestic constitutional law. And that makes it difficult. I, I see that in my own country, uh, proportionality analysis is not available on the legislative level when it comes to social rights. And that is a challenge many countries haven't even realized is there, uh, but it makes it difficult. Um, then to incorporate procedural rights. It's, it's, uh, you, I think we, we get to an easier part here because uh, you, you can ad adapt uh, uh, procedural laws, administrative procedure laws, criminal procedure, uh, civil procedure, and include uh, the necessary uh, procedural accommodation that, that you need under Article 13. Um, however, I have not seen a country that really that's really done it. Um, I already mentioned equal recognition before the law under Article 12. Um, it requires a different thinking about uh, how to deal with uh, persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Uh, and that usually goes to the root of civil law understanding of who is competent to have a legally binding will. And uh, that is a challenge, first of all, for the lawyers, because we lawyers have been steeped in the, in the Roman thinking about, uh, about these issues. And it's not uh, simple to get over this. Um, then we have the, the organizational uh, and procedural obligations, monitoring and participation of organizations of persons with disabilities. Uh, monitoring is one of the easier ones. You need to have the independent uh, structure with sufficient finances and, and competencies, but the participation of persons with disabilities and their organizations in all uh, procedures that in the end affect them, which means all states' uh, procedures on the state level. That requires substantial reframing of legislative processes uh, on the parliamentary parliamentary level, but also on the executive level. Uh, not very simple to do. Um, uh, I think I've already uh, used up my time, if I if I count correctly. Uh, I was allotted 10 minutes. So we could go on with tons of additional uh, questions here. The thing is, in my opinion, it's very interesting uh, to deal with incorporation and implementation of the convention. It is extremely difficult and it requires uh, fundamental shifts in how we approach legal uh, issues and legal principles that we've come that we've come to uh, uh, that we've uh, grown accustomed to, and that's uh, for the lawyers very difficult to achieve. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that uh, summary. I think that this is something that we, as organisations of persons with disabilities, are so aware that it's been so traditional in the legal system and the political system to make exceptions for persons with disabilities. Simple things, everyone has a right to education, except everyone has a right to decide, except, and that this is tied into so many legal structures and also beliefs and people's professional training that to undo it is a, is a huge challenge. So now it's a great moment to switch over and to move, and thank you very much, Marcus, uh, to switch over and move to hear what's happening in the different Nordic countries. So we're going to hear from Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and Sweden. Very shortly, what's happening in each country in this context. So I'd love to see you on camera if you're there, Sif. I think you're there. I see in the participants' room. We have Sif Holst, who's the Vice Chair of Disabled People's Organizations in Denmark. If everyone could keep to about two minutes, this would be great. It's lovely to see you, Sif. And thank you, and you too. Very shortly in Denmark, we do have some really small progresses. One of them was uh, the an anti-discrimination law, but unfortunately, it did not uh, incorporate reasonable accommodation. 
So in fact, you are more or less still able to discriminate and it only encompasses some areas. It seems to be really difficult uh, in Denmark to have this movement to go from some really nice paper and some really beautiful words to go and take it into to the national context. Uh, and especially this year where we do seem to have uh, a lot of cutbacks in the areas of disability. So not too many good news from Denmark. Thank you. You were extremely brief. <laughs> so thank you very much, Sif. And it is disappointing there that you have this fundamental principle in the convention that was then excluded from, from national legislation. And it just shows that every single development we have to still fight for and uh, campaign for. Thank you very much. So I'm going to give the floor now. We're going to go to Finland. And we heard from the beginning that the situation in Finland is also slightly different. So we have uh, Pauli Rautiainen. And Polly, we'd be re really interested to hear an update from Finland. Thank you. Uh, as background information, Finland signed the convention in 2007 and ratified it in 2016. And I will first use the short time I have available uh, for the accessibility example, because it's uh, illustrative. And then secondly, I will say a few words about uh, SK versus Finland uh, decision. Well, first of all, uh, in Finland, when the CRPD was incorporated, a working group of the Ministry of Justice in which disabled people's organizations, plenty of organizations were represented, concluded that national legislation on accessibility was in line with the CRPD and no amendments were needed. All the disability organizations represented in the uh, working group agreed on this point. Since then, however, the Supreme Administrative Court has found in several rulings that the interpretation has been uh, incorrect, incorrect and the existing legislation is problematic from the CRPD perspective. However, the government has not taken any steps to remedy this, this situation. Even in the context of the Reform of Equality Act, the last Marine government even refers to add the violation of accessibility obligations as an independent ground for discrimination into the Equality Act. Also, uh, in the context of incorporation of Accessibility Act, Constitutional Committee of the Parliament considered the government's proposal to be contrary to the CRPD and the Constitution. And it seems that in Finland, the promotion of CRPD application has become a matter of legal system, in particular the courts, the Constitutional Committee and the Equality and Non-Discrimination Tribunal. And in this sense, it's uh, regrettable that the disability organizations are not actively taking cases to courts. It's more up to individuals and a couple of active lawyers. Finally, it is probably worth mentioning that Finland has received a ruling from the UN CRPD committee in ESCO versus Finland case on Article 19 of the uh, convention. The uh, CRPD committee found that the fact that authorities in Finland rejected uh, SK's application for personal assistance on the basis of resource criteria was indirect discrimination against uh, persons with intellectual disabilities. The state has not taken any steps to fully change the legal situation, and the state has even refused to pay compensation to SK. It seems that uh, Finland does not take CRPD obligations seriously at the political level, which is in line with the fact that current uh, government, Petteri Orpo's government, has publicly stated that Finland does not intend to fully comply its human rights obligations. The question is therefore about Finnish human rights policy in general, not only about the CRPD. So to conclude, um uh, that in this situation it is unfortunate 
fortunate that in Finland, disability organizations treat CRPD as a political document rather than a binding legal document, even though its legal value has been broadly recognized by the courts in Finland. We would need to develop the will and capacity for strategic litigation by the organizations of uh, disabled persons. Thank you so much for this update from Finland and also for this call to action, actually to organizations to more actively use the convention as a legal tool. And it's a good moment then to switch to Iceland because this is exactly what we will hear about. So we have um, Alma Ingels Dosser, who's the chair and spokesperson of the Icelandic Disability Alliance. And Alma, I understand that you have been. I know from our board member from Iceland um, and also from my briefing from Mia that you have been taking cases to court and you've found something in relation to incorporation of the convention as a challenge there. Thank you very much for updating us on this. Hi, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, thank you. About the implementation, um, the recent years the CRPD has been implemented into national legislation. Uh, in 2018, the Act on Services for Persons with Disability was from maybe the first big step towards implementing the CRPD. And its main purpose is to comply with the CRPD. Despite that, Disputes over the provisions have occurred and court cases have been pursued. Uh, just this year, uh, if I continue with the implementation, a national plan was uh, accepted in Althingi, the, the parliamentary, and that plan is the first national plan towards persons with disability. And implementation and leg legalization is the big part of this national plan. So for the first time, a comprehensive policy on the issue of disabled persons have been accepted. So yeah, Althingi has approved this parliamentary resolution proposal. And this plan includes 60 actions to implement the provisions of the CRPD. And also an agreement on on the government cooperation states that the CRPD should be and will be enacted on this uh, on their like time, but it hasn't been yet. So we are still waiting on what will happen. So that's probably like the status that's going on in Iceland regarding the implementation. And hopefully this national plan will improve and take it further and at the end that we will fully legalize the convention. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so coming from Iceland, we're now going to go to Sweden and we have Anna Bruce, who's a senior researcher at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. Anna, we're looking forward to hearing an update from Sweden. Uh, thank you very much. I want to, I'm probably speaking to the already converted, but I still want to make a case for uh, incorporation of the CRPD in Sweden. So the current position uh, of the Swedish government is that we should wait until we know more about how the effects of the incorporation of the CRC in Swedish law, which has already happened. Um, so we're waiting and seeing. Um, and what I want to emphasize is that in addition to the recommendations by the CRPD committee in 2014 and 2024 to incorporate uh, the CRPD in Swedish law, the recent recommendations from um, 2024 speak to serious systematic implementation problems in Sweden and problems that we do have evidence that incorporation of the CRPD would not solve by itself, but would be an important tool in addressing uh, the closing statement of the CRPD committee now in March in the very recent review on Sweden uh, was very clear on the lack of understanding and knowledge of the CRPD in Sweden. And I quote, uh, the committee is concerned about how Sweden will achieve this transformation when it does not appear to understand the standards and principles of the convention and its obligations in meeting these standards and principles, end quote. 
Uh, and in addition, many of the recommendations in the concluding observations adopted after the review of Sweden just last month point uh, to the need to make sure that existing and future legislation is in line with the convention, and also that the CRPD can be effectively implemented in individual cases through the court system. And these systematic failures are not new. Uh, my research into the ratification process in Sweden showed that there was a very dated understanding of the CRPD in this process, underestimating the rights and obligations. It also shows clearly an overestimation of Swedish law, policy and reality. And as a consequence, the conclusions were made that we don't need uh, to change any Swedish law in order to be uh, in line with the convention. So we still have a lot of laws that are not in line with the convention. Uh, many are there since uh, this was decided. And so last month, the Swedish National Audit Office reported that um, while incorporating the CRC did not solve all the systemic implementation problems in Sweden, which go beyond disability rights and go to human rights generally, the incorpor incorporation of the CRC had led to increased knowledge uh, of the CRC uh, and acknowledgement of the importance of children's rights in public operations, increased use of the CRC in courts, and increased action to align Swedish law with the CRC. So my point is that there is no doubt that the problems we faced in relation to the CRPD, um, and there is no doubt that incorporation is a way of addressing these, and is indeed, in CRPD language, an appropriate measure. So there's really no excuse not to start this process now. Thank you very much, especially for bringing in the example from the CRC at the end. And I'm really I'm going to hand the floor now over to uh, Marie Sten, who's the chair of the Nordic Cooperation Council for Federations of Disability Organizations. And she's going to um, give us the call to action, the conclusions, and, and also close the webinar. And so it's goodbye from me. And thank you very much to all the speakers and also to the organizers for inviting me today. It's been really a great learning experience. Thank you. So, OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. <clears throat> and thank you, everyone. And uh, it was a really interesting meeting. And as you said, I'm the chair for the Nordic Cooperation Council for Federation of Disability Organizations. And we will handing over recommend recommendations to the Swedish presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers. And it is to Camilla Valtesson Grönvall. She is the Swedish Minister for Social Services, and she is responsible for the CRPD. And the HNR calls on the governments of the Nordic countries. Uh, the first one is respect recommendations from the United Nations to incorporate the convention into national law. The second one is draw up political action plans to implement recommendations from the United Nations. And the third one, ensure resources for the organizations representing persons with disabilities to participate in the planning to implement the recommendations in a systematic manner in accordance with Article 33.3 .3 and General Comment 7. And if you look in the chat, you can see uh, uh, you have a link to the webinar next week on the monitoring uh, to the CRPD in the Nordic countries. It is on the 17th of April, where it is organi organized by the Swedish presidency of the Nordic Council. And uh, I shall close the meeting. And first of all, I want to say a big thanks to Catherine, because I know we have taken time from your vacation. So really nice to have you here today. And even thanks to the sign language interpreter. Thank to you. And of course, we have to keep on working so it gets better. Thank you all.